Get ready to get your questions answered by financial advisors. Learn how to put more money back in your pockets regardless of where you're starting your financial journey with your host, Hannah Mitria. Welcome back everybody to Virtual US Financial Advisor Podcast. I'm so excited to have Phil Weiss here with me. Phil is the principal of Apprise Wealth Management. So welcome to the show, Phil. Thanks for having me, Hannah. Happy to be here today. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, so I'm really excited to talk. We're going to be kind of discussing a little bit of life planning, financial planning, but really around like women facing new beginnings and just that a different approach of that kind of thing. And like those steps that women need to be taking to those new beginnings, whether it's through wealth management or things like that. But before we jump into that, share with us a little bit about why this is the thing that like you're passionate about and how you kind of got into wealth management where you focus with women. Sure. So my why for what I do really goes back to growing up in my household. It was the typical model. My father was responsible for the finances, but he was not good at it. We had unpaid bills. We had utilities turned off, TV turned off, phone, electricity, all those things. I remember when I got my old enough to drive, going into the electric company and paying the bills so that we get our electricity turned back on. When it was time to go to college, I was told I could go anywhere I wanted. I chose to go to Duke. I was a pre-med, going to be pre-med and a psychology major. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, my father didn't pay. So I left school after three years. Mm-hmm. Three yeah. years. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of schooling you had done. It just did, there was just not going to be enough money to finish. So it was, the idea was to leave school, earn the money to go back. But at that point, I didn't feel like the medical profession was right for me. And I decided I wanted to do accounting. I was always good in math. So when it was time to go back to school, Duke doesn't offer accounting degrees. So I had moved to Arizona while I was out of school. Mm-hmm. And I applied to in University of Arizona. And I lived in Tucson and I applied at Rutgers because I had residency technically in both states. Mm-hmm. And I ultimately decided to go to Rutgers because I thought I'd get a better job coming out of school. Okay. Uh, I talked about my father. So later on, after I was done with school, I found out that he had forged my name to open up credit cards because he couldn't get credit mm-hmm. and started working all that. And my mom had gone back to school herself. She went back to school in her forties. She became an occupational therapist and ultimately started her own business. And while we never had the direct conversation, I'm comfortable to say that the reason she did that was she was trying to get herself where she was strong enough that she could survive on her own. Unfortunately, she came down with breast cancer. It was stage four. She was so focused on her business, she didn't take care of herself. Mm -hmm. And that was when we found out how bad the family finances really were. Mm -hmm. My parents had to sell their house while my mother was in a treatment and moved because they couldn't afford to be where they were. She asked me to help. I did what I could, but unfortunately her cancer metastasized to her brain and she passed. And so I kind of view that what I'm doing now is I'm still trying to help my mom. I'm trying to help keep other women from having the same kind of things happen to them that happened to my mother and just to be able to be more confident about their financial future and where they can go. And I feel like even when I was in school, we didn't really learn about money too much. And I can only imagine... Our parents learned even less, especially our mothers learned even less about money because we live, we grew up in a world where the man was the provider and that was the world we lived in no longer. It's much more two income households. So where is somewhere you start on the education side of it? So I love the point that you just made, because just so you know, part of the reason I called the firm a prize is because a prize means to inform. And so it's important to me to help educate people and have them understand the whys behind what I recommend and what I do, as opposed to just saying, here, do this, or I got this for you. It doesn't work that way. I want people to be educated. That's really important. That's why I blog too. Like every week I put out a blog and those blogs are meant to help educate because I I agree with you completely. Our education in our financial system is terrible. Mm -hmm. So where do you start? It's a hard question because the schools don't really do a good job. Fortunately, we have things like the internet. There's lots of resources out there to go look for material. We tried to make our kids. They didn't always like it. Take an accounting course in high school just to give them some understanding of some of these concepts. You know, if you have kids, it's sad, but we, it's probably easier for us to talk about sex than it is about money, at least mm-hmm. for most people. Yeah. So have conversations. 
try and impart some knowledge that just basic things mm -hmm. like, when you have a credit card if you have a credit card it's really important to pay the balance in full because if you don't it can have pretty serious consequences i saw that personally because when i went when i went back to school i paid part of my education with credit cards i paid tuition i paid rent if i didn't have money i wrote credit card checks mm -hmm. and then i looked and saw how much i paid in interest i'm like oh my god i can't do this so that's when i decided I created my own plan, which is actually, without knowing it, one of the two ways that they talk about in terms of how to attack debt. It mm -hmm. was one of the two. And I put a plan in place and I paid it off early. Um, you know, when you think about make savings really a key part, like I wrote a blog called Pay Yourself First. Mm -hmm. If you work for a company and they have a 401k or some type of plan like that, at least put in enough to get the match because that's really part of your compensation. If you don't take it, Mm -hmm. you're giving the company a break because they assumed that you were going to take it when they decided how much they were going to pay you. So if you don't take it, you're really giving money away. Yeah. At least put in enough to get the match. Have an idea what your inflows and outflows are. You don't have to necessarily have a detailed budget, but at least know how much is coming in and how much is going out in broad terms so that you don't end up with not enough. And think about there's the 50, 30, 20 rule. The 50% is for like the stuff that you have to pay like in, in accounting terms, I call like my fixed expenses. Mm -hmm. That could be your rent. It could be your mortgage, whatever that is. And you, your certain payments, yeah. then 30% is going to be for things that you kind of want to do. And 20% is really going to be for saving. Or if you have debt before you save to, you know, I said to take that 401k match, but if you have debts, the rest of that should be going to pay down your debt before you start to save too much. Cause if you think about it, if you have a credit card that's got 15, 18, 20%, whatever the rate of interest is on it, if you're paying that debt off, that's like whatever that interest rate is, that's your return. And you can't guarantee that return anywhere. Just like, you know, if you got, if I go back to the employee match for a second, common match is put in 6% of your salary, you get a 3% match. That's a 50% return right there, right? Because you're getting half as much as you put in. You can't beat that anywhere. So when you're thinking about those interest rates, you want to, look at what's the highest one, pay that one first. That's how I like to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And think about that. That's a guaranteed return, yeah. right? So think about how you're dividing your money and put it into a system like that, but also read. Or if you don't want to read, find somebody that you know is knowledgeable and talk to them. They mm -hmm. can help. Yeah. And like a couple of things I kind of thought of when you mentioned how there's like all the information on the internet and then also how it's so hard to talk to your kids about money and both of them in my mind kind of one we have there's like you said there's so much information that we get overwhelmed by the amount mm -hmm. and then we don't talk to our kids about money because we don't know what's right and so we kind of get stuck in that loop and I know you kind of mentioned a lot of things right there too and all of them are like I feel like very fundamental things that we can kind of take and look at and do but how do you Maybe even help unlearn some of like because some things we learn about money is to fear it and things like that. How do you help people unlearn the things they shouldn't learn? A lot of how we think about money comes back to childhood. Mm -hmm. right? We get a lot of childhood messages. Like I will ask clients, like, what's your first money of memory? Mm -hmm. Because that can tell a lot. And I look for messages when I talk to, to my clients, to my prospects in terms of where they are, because you can go from like where money is. If you think about the beginning of my training to become a registered life planner, we started with the seven stages of money maturity. It's a book written by George Kinder, who's the one who founded the Kinder Institute and is responsible for the registered life planning process. And I'm not remembering all the stages off the top of my head right now, but they kind of start with, you know, child innocence is certainly one of the ones at the beginning, but we get a lot of guilt around money. Mm -hmm. things like that. So you want to think about like, what was it about money in your house? Like I told you my story, right? Like money was just, there wasn't, you know, there's two type of role models, right? You have the good ones and the bad ones. Mm -hmm. I had a bad one, but it was really very instructive because it taught me everything not to do. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of how do we unlearn, I think really in that case, because we don't always know that we're looking at the right thing. There is so much out there. So mm -hmm. like there are certain websites that I think are better than others. If you're just trying to learn, like Investopedia has a lot of instructive articles. Nerd Wallet has a lot of instructive articles that are meant to help people learn and have some basic concepts. Mm -hmm. But find somebody that you know that is good with money. And sometimes I guess that's hard. So it's not like I know any everybody that's good with money. 
But if you can find somebody like that and have a conversation, I know I have people that have reached out to me that are not ready to have a financial advisor, mm -hmm. but I'm more than happy to have a conversation and help talk with them and help get them on the right track to some things that will help them set a good path. So hopefully someday they'll remember that. And if they do decide they want an advisor, they'll come back to me. But if not, I've still helped somebody. Yeah. And I love that. They're so there just as that, that guide, essentially, on um, where you need to get to. Like thinking, like as we're talking, I'm thinking about like trying to figure out like what was that first money memory for me? And like the thing that keeps coming back to me is like money was invisible. We didn't talk about it. <laughs> we didn't always have it. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we still always had a house kind of thing but it was definitely I, I can relate coming home and the water electricity being turned off and it's like oh crap yeah. what happened oh uh, so, and I, I very much think me and my siblings all really had to relearn money and are still learning money because we grew up probably very similar and the money just wasn't managed in the way that built wealth long term so as people are starting to learn it, so you're educating them on the money. So what are those first steps in the wealth management life planning stage that you kind of have to start with? So life planning, I think is really important because what life planning does, besides the fact that it's financial planning done right, mm -hmm. it helps you to better align how you spend your money with what's most important to you. So the life planning process, there's a five letter acronym that you used for the process, which is evoke. Mm -hmm. So the first part of that, so we have a just an open conversation. You can start with a question as simple as, why are you here today? What led you to schedule this meeting? But during the course of that meeting, what I'm really trying to start to identify is what is it that would allow you to live your most fulfilled life? Mm -hmm. From there, and, and I don't talk a lot when I have these meetings. It's more about listening because a lot of times it's hard to find some, somebody that listens to you. And if you think about it, if somebody asks you what your best conversations are, a lot of times it's the one where the person that says it was great, they might have done all the talking and you just listened. And they think it's a great conversation because they were heard. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you give people a chance to be heard. From there, there's three questions that we ask. And those three questions, and this is it during the vision meeting, which is the second meeting. And the first question is basically, imagine that money was no object and you could do anything you wanted. What would you do and how would you live your life? There's a lot of ways that you go with that. I mean, you can really dream big, right? You don't have supposed to hold back on your dreams. Yeah. But then we start to get closer to reality, right? So now the second question is, this time, money is part of the equation. And you go to the doctor and you get the unfortunate news that you have five to 10 years left to live. The good news is you're not ever going to feel sick during that period. The bad news is you don't know when you're going to go. Mm -hmm. Now it's, Again, what would you do and how would you live your life? And if there's anything you would change. And the last question is the hardest of all. It's this time you go to the doctor and you get the very unfortunate news that today's the day. Mm -hmm. You're going to die today. Now it's not what would you do. It's what did you not get to do? Who did you not get to be? And by going through these questions, and that's a really important question. Some people think it's about regret. Mm -hmm. It's not. To me, it's about avoiding regret. And I say that because if I can identify those things now, there's things that I could do so that when I get to the end of my life, I don't regret not having done them. Mm -hmm. So the training that I did, it's experiential. So like the, I told you about the story with my mom. So the first element of my life plan is to start a scholarship for women that go back to school later in life. Mm -hmm. It's going to start small. I already recently put the first amount of money aside for it. Yeah. And I need to build it more before I can get to that point. But ultimately, I'd love to tie it to a percentage of the revenues for my business. That's really where I want to get. Mm -hmm. But that's something like, I can start doing that now. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wait till I'm going to die and say, I'm going to leave money to that or something like that. I can start it now. I don't have to wait. Mm -hmm. Like it's those type of things. And then from that, we create a vision statement. And a vision statement is something that for you to accomplish in the next, usually 12 to 24 months, kind of laid out there. It's got the things that you've identified that are most important, they're not all going to be financial, but it's to help motivate you to do these things and to live your most fulfilled life. And the third meeting, the O is for obstacles. And this time we ask you, what can possibly get in the way of you mm -hmm. being able to do these things? And then it's, what can you do about that? How can you address it? 
When are you going to do it by and who can help you? And again, these are you thinking, I'm not giving you answers. I'm helping you come to your answers on your own. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we go to the K, which is knowledge. So that's where my knowledge as a financial professional starts to come into play to help tie your finances back in to allow you to do these things and position you to do them. And then the last E is basically go do it, experience it. Mm -hmm. And you put that and like a lot of times people have difficulty following through on things on when you have a financial planner, you have steps to do. But now, because we've gone through this process, it usually means that you end up, you're motivated to do it. You have greater buy-in and now you're more likely to accomplish these things. And that doesn't mean that the plan that you come up with today is a plan for the rest of your life. Yeah. It's like when I went through training, there were two people that were supposed to be instructors, but because people came down with COVID while we were the one before we got there and one while we were there, they had to also participate. They got new life plans because you might have accomplished what was already in your life plans. So now you're looking to do what's next. Yeah. Right? Like if I get this scholarship going to where I want, then it's there. I don't need to worry about it in theory anymore because I know it's there. I'm going to fund it. But what else would I like to do? So mm -hmm. it's the same thing. So it's just really that helps you. It, it's very important. Like I know I had a client that came to me right after I got back from the middle segment of my training. And she said, I'm really stressed. She's got one daughter that had started college that year. The other one's in high school. Her job was really stressful. She went on family leave. I said, let's work on your life plan. And we did. And now when I talked, and so that was probably we finished up in March or April. And now when I look at her and I talk to her, she's like, she looks like, and she sounds like a different person. I recently did a workshop for women about investing and talk, incorporating some of these comments. And she put in the comments, life planning is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Because now like it gave her the confidence that like working together, it gave her the confidence to know that she didn't have to work. She didn't have to put herself through that. Now she can do things that she wants because the reason she was in that position, I mean, she was very good with money. Her and her husband both had nice jobs and they basically lived on one salary and saved the other. So that's how they got to that position. Mm -hmm. But building that life plan as the foundation is really an important part. And that's the best way to start to me. Yeah, I, I can definitely see where the value in that is. I think, you know, so often I talk to financial advisors and it's all about retirement, passing on, like passing your money on to your next generation and things like that. But we forget about the life that we're currently living. We're always planning that money for the future and the future is not guaranteed. Like that's the last question you had. <laughs> like, yeah. And I think, you know, I personally have always just lived the life of when it comes to money of you know, what is those things that I want? And so there has to be that balance still of the planning for the future and saving the money, but it's creating that plan to have that motivation to understand why you're saving the money. And what's the balance of, am I still enjoying life today? And so I really think that's valuable and not a lot of people talk about it because they want to jump right into the financial planning and the future planning and mm -hmm. <laughs> when they'll retire, but not everybody retires. We don't all get there. And so we have to plan a future for today. And so I really love that you're working that in and that is a key component. And it's so unique. Like, is that something that's newer with life planning? Or I guess, why do not more financial planners talk about it? So it's not new, new, but it's not widespread. Mm -hmm. I believe when I started the program that I read that there were like 600 or so registered life planners across the globe. Because it's not just a U.S. Uh -huh. designation. It's not a lot, right? Yeah. You know, there's a conference that I went to in September for the first time, a group called Nasruddin. And so it's financial advisors like myself that have this life planning focus, but also there were financial therapists and other people that deal with that behavioral side of money. And I think that the whole behavioral side of money is becoming a lot more important. Mm -hmm. And I think that putting this layer in there to help you really it helps you associate why you're doing this, right? Why am I saving? What am I saving for? What matters to me? And making those things all come together. I just think it makes it so much more meaningful. Yeah. Why more people don't do it? I think because a lot of times, you know, I know I, I'm a CPA and I'm also a CFA charter holder and now I'm doing this. But I said I was a psychology major, but something like, it seems unusual, but I go back to my psychology roots. But mm -hmm. I like the relationship side of the business. I like to really get to know my clients. 
So doing this work really helps me get to know my clients. So I have my life plan. I've shared it. It's You can find it on my website because if my clients are going to tell me these things, I'm going to tell them. Mm-hmm. So I think it's up to the individual, but a lot of people, they're very much about the numbers. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's a process that says you know, we're supposed to save. We have these finite goals. We have these finite amounts, but you know, not everything even goes the way that we think it's going to go or that we want it to go either. So putting in here, you know, we have our priorities. Those are the things that we really know we want to accomplish. Then we have kind of our, they'd be nice to have. And then we have like our wishes, right? Yeah. So we want to make sure you at least get those must haves in there. And I just think if you do that, it just helps to improve your quality of life. So like I said before, to me, life planning is financial planning done right. Doesn't mean that other stuff doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. How much you save, how much you earn, all those things matter. But if you put this on, if you integrate it with this, I think it just becomes so much more meaningful. I wish more people did do it this way. Yeah, definitely. So once people go through that life planning process, so they go through the evoke. Evoke, yes. Go through evoke. What's that next step then? So that's when we go, you know, it's kind of integrated in because I said the K was for knowledge, right? So that's when we start to, now we've done the life plan. So we know those things that are important that we really want to make sure that you kind of, that we want to position you to accomplish. So now we build the life plan Mm -hmm. around those things so that I never want to say, no, you can't do anything. If something's really important to you, we're going to figure out a way. So Mm -hmm. by identifying those things first, now we can build the financial part of your life plan that incorporates those things and positions you to achieve them you know how much do i need to save to do this and how much do i need to save to do that and and how those type of things Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and i know kind of like in your ebook and your steps it's kind of like planning for like the longevity and kind of investing in the future is kind of like in there so how did those kind of tie into the life planning or how do those progress into our next steps here so planning for longevity just means like First of all, we don't know how long we're going to live. Yeah. You said that before. We don't. But we want to make sure that we've done our best to position ourselves to live for a long time. I know people say, I don't, or some people say, I don't want to leave anything to anybody. I want, I want to die with a penny. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, that that's nice. It's <laughs> kind of hard to do, right? Because we don't know for sure how long we're going to live. Mm-hmm. But to me, when I think about planning for longevity and investing in the future. Part of it's about not taking unnecessary risk too. You know, if I think about investing, you know, if we listen to the financial media, they talk about beating the market all the time. Mm-hmm. But you know, beating the market implies taking on risk. And it's great if that risk leads to more, but what's not so great is it leads to less. Mm-hmm. Right? So we want to figure out what kind of investment strategy in terms of how much to save and how to invest it matches with what your needs are. Because I'd rather, I don't want to be the one that tells you, you can't do this anymore because your portfolio just lost a lot of money. No. Because we tried to beat the market, we didn't. And now when you don't beat the market and the market goes down, you're likely to lose more than the market. I'd rather position you so that we're trying to lose less. We might not make as much on the upside too, We'll still make something when the market goes up, but really want to try to avoid those big losses. Because think about it. If your portfolio goes down, let's say that it was worth 100 and it goes down 20%. So now it's worth 80. Mm-hmm. It has to go up 25% to go back to even. So if we can limit some of those losses, it makes it less that we have to recover, mm-hmm. basically. So those are the things. And so we want to figure out how much, like I said, how much do we have to save? And how do we want to invest it? Those are really important parts of that. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, not leaving anything behind and dying with a penny is so unrealistic. <laughs> like, and, you know, I think of Brewster's Millions all the time whenever I'm talking on the podcast, just because it's one of those things where it's not easy to just end with no money. <laughs> so right. that, Not that and you want to be able to build the money since you can't predict what the end is in any way. So for anyone listening to the podcast right now, what are those like, big takeaways in life planning and wealth management you would want them to know? So I'd like to think of this. You can do what I do yourself if you want, but to me, you have to have three things and I'll use another acronym. It's KIT. You have to have the knowledge, you have to have the interest, and you have to have probably the most important of all and the hardest one is time to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. If you have those things, you can, but what happens too is that as we get older, our lives get more complicated, right? We have families, we have kids, 
or even if you don't have kids, you still have families, your job gets more complicated, everything gets more complicated and you have less time. And so it can really help to find somebody that can help you. When you're looking for somebody to help you, you want to make sure that there's somebody that you can communicate with, that you're comfortable with, because especially if you do a life plan, you're going to divulge a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And if you're not comfortable working with that person, it's the old garbage in, garbage out, right? You're not going to have a good result. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that if you're not going to do it yourself, find a good partner for you. There's a lot of financial advisors out there. You know, I never think of myself as being in competition with others because I might not be the best person for you. Mm -hmm. Somebody else is, but I might not be the one. I might be. You have to find that out. So you want to ask good questions. You want to make sure that when you're thinking about working with somebody that you want them to be a fiduciary, which means that they're supposed to work in your best interest and not theirs. You want them to know that they're on your side and they're looking out for you. You want to have somebody that you can have confidence in, that you can go to and ask questions. Like I always believe that there's no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb questions are the ones we don't ask. Because if we don't ask, then we don't know the answer. That's when it's being dumb. But asking the question itself, if you don't know, you have to ask. Mm -hmm. Those things are really important. And that concept I talked about earlier about paying yourself first, it's really important because if we put money directly out of our paycheck into a brokerage account, into a retirement account, into a savings account, whatever it may be, we have to go to extra steps to access it. Sometimes those extra steps might cost us money too. Like if it's a retirement account, we're not old enough to pull it out, but it makes it harder to get to it. So if it's not sitting in your checking account, you don't look and say, oh, I got this much. It's a lot harder to spend it when you don't have it. Yeah. If you have credit cards, use them responsibly. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one of my kids say, dad, why do you use credit cards? They're dangerous. They're not dangerous. If I pay the balance in full, I, right, I spend the money that I know that I can repay. Actually, they can be rewarding, right? Because you can get a free credit card with a 25-day grace period. So there's no interest as long as you pay the balance in full. And they'll give you rewards yeah. that you can use for other things. So just it's all about responsibility, taking yeah. responsibility, being responsible, having a good process. So we don't necessarily have to budget detail, but you have to know at least that you're not spending more than you're taking in. Because if you do that, you're going in the wrong direction. And also... Don't forget about taxes. A lot of times when it comes to taxes, we think about taxes when January and February come and we start getting 1099s and W-2s and all this information about what just happened. Mm -hmm. For the most part, that's too late to do any planning. To me, taxes and investing are joined at the hip. So when I work with my clients, tax planning is such an important part of what we do because I think about the fact that it's not about how much tax I pay in a given year. Mm -hmm. It's how much tax I pay over my lifetime. So I want to reduce and lower my lifetime tax liability. I have clients that they might be in their 70s and I'm still having them do Roth conversions because if I look at, and a Roth conversion is taking money that you have in a regular IRA or regular 401k, which you didn't pay tax when you put the money in, you pay tax when you pull the money out. Mm -hmm. Well, there are times it makes sense to make it a Roth where you pay tax on the money that goes in, but you don't pay tax on the money that comes out. And doing that, I call this bracket stuffing. I look at what tax brackets you're in. You know, the marginal tax rates right now are 12%, 22%, 10%, 12%, 22%, 24%, 32%, and 35 or 37. I so, you know, if we're in the 12% bracket and we have room and I look at your plan and what looks like coming in the future could put you into a higher tax rate, let's fill up that 12% bracket. If we're in the 22% bracket, and again, it looks like it could be higher in the future, let's fill that. We might even fill the 24 because the current tax rate system that we have is only in existence until 2025. The legislation that put this into place passed in 2017, effective in 2018, it's good for eight years. Mm -hmm. At the end of 2025, we go back to the old system unless they do something new. And while I don't like to forecast or prognosticate much of anything, <laughs> if I look at tax rates... It feels like if you look at the size of the deficit and all the money that's been spent and everything, most people would tell you they expect tax rates to go up, not down, yeah. when they do work out what comes next. So we have really low rates. So if you have opportunities to do things like Roth conversions, or even think about maybe funding a Roth instead of if your work has a regular 401k and a Roth 401k, look at your tax bracket. It might make sense to put it into the Roth now, especially like this is something for people just starting out. Like I have a, one of my sons just started work this year. I wanted to put money into his Roth because his tax rate's low. Mm, yeah. He can pay 12% tax 
on that money, hopefully it grows over time and I'll never have to pay tax on it again. Mm -hmm. That 12% deduction that you get if you put into the regular 401k, that sounds nice, but I'd rather just pay and lock in that 12% rate and not have to worry about it in the future. So you want to think about things like that too. To do good tax planning, you have to think ahead. You have to do it now. Now is getting starting to get late, right? Because we only yeah. have another month in the year when we're speaking. But think about taxes during the year for that year and the future instead of just waiting till you get this bunch of paper in the mail that tells you all the, or sometimes it's emailed, I know, but you get all this information. This is what you earned last year. Mm -hmm. Now you give it to your account. There's not much that they can do to plan. You know, you can fund an IRA contribution because you have to like April 15th, if you qualify to put that in, but there's not a lot of other things that you can do after the year is over. Yeah. Think about it before. Definitely. That's a lot of information and we're definitely gonna have to talk after this, <laughs> <laughs> but let everybody know that's listening. How can they reach out to you? And who is that person that should reach out to you? So the easiest way to reach out to me is, as you said, my company is Apprise Wealth Management. Mm -hmm. And so my website is apprisewealth.com. That's A-P-P-R-I-S-E, wealth. If you go there, I have an ebook that you can download. I also have a blog that you can sign up. You can also go to my contact page and reach me through there. If you don't want to just send an email, it'll get to me that way too. That's all my contact information. In terms of you know, who I work with, I like to say that experiencing big life transitions can be stressful. So my job is to help women, empower women facing new beginnings with the financial knowledge and tools they need to make self-assured decisions. My firm is Apprise Wealth Management. You can download my free ebook, which is called How to Flourish Through Life's Big Changes at apprisewealth.com slash ebook. And like I said, you can also go there and sign up for my blog. Awesome. And we'll make sure to put all of those also in the show notes. So anybody that's listening, that's like, I didn't write that down fast enough. Don't worry, just hit show more and you can see exactly <laughs> what Phil has for you. Thank you so much, Phil, for joining me today, sharing all this information. I have so many things to like think on and figure out now. So I really appreciate it. Tons of value. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and I enjoyed it. And thanks so much for having me on. It was great. Thank you for joining us this week on the Virtual U.S. Financial Advisor Podcast. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or via RSS so you'll never miss an episode. We'd love a rating on iTunes, or better yet, tell a friend about the show, which will help us grow as well. If you want to learn from any of our financial advisors, head over to our website, virtualusfinancialadvisor.com, to learn more about each financial advisor and connect with them personally. Be sure to tune in next week to get more advice from the expert financial advisors. See you on the next episode.